Hey, kids, do you like wrestling? Well, we like wrestling, too. We are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Myself and Chris Novembrino kind of doing a lazy river of wrestling criticism, going through the news and whatever happened in stateside television wrestling. And also, you know what? Sometimes we just like to watch old stuff and talk about that, too. Love for you to give us a listen. If you haven't already, we are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Welcome back to another episode of The Good, The Bad, and The Hungy here on the Voice of Wrestling Podcasting Network. I'm your host, Tyler Fornis, and with me today is my dog, Odie. It's just going to be me today. Fred decided to go and compete in a massive Scrabble tournament because he is the smarter of the two of us, and I'm excited to kind of hear all about it when he comes back, uh, that along with me trying to pursue another career change, which is coming in the works, and we will announce that likely on next week's show uh, was the reason why we did not go live last week and have a conversation about a really interesting dynamite. And I'll touch on that here because Will Ospreay versus MJF was a fantastic match. 59 minutes, 58 seconds, MJF cheating to win. Now you can say, Hey, why would you go 59 minutes and 58 seconds just for MJF to cheat? Well, that's MJF. That's the epitome of the character. And I think if you did it with somebody else, it wouldn't work as well because, well, why would you wait that long to cheat when you want to cheat earlier to win? MJF is a deeply insecure character. And how much of that comes from kayfabe and how much of that is like reality, I, I really don't know. Uh, but he plays it incredibly well. And he wants to win on his own attrition. But sometimes he just knows, hey, I'm struggling. I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. So he goes to that Dynamite Diamond. He's done it consistently before. He's done it to win back the Dynamite Diamond. So none of this is really a surprise. But waiting that long to cheat to be able to try and get the victory, I think works for MJF. I don't think it works for other people in professional wrestling. Uh, you could probably pick one or two. Oh, it would work for them too. But because of how the MJF character is built, I thought it really worked as a finish. Yeah, is it a little deflating? Absolutely. It's incredibly deflating to have MJF just cheat to win after, honestly, a fantastic match. These two had really good chemistry. They worked well. MJF got hit by a seven-year-old in the crowd, which is tremendous visual. And they had a great match. Now, I could do without Will Ospreay and the Tiger Driver stuff. Like, yeah, you hit Swerve with it, no problem. You didn't even hesitate. And it would have been nice if it was over at that point, but then he hesitated on MJF. I don't get that. You hate MJF. You had respect for Swerve. There was a mutual respect and friendship between the two of you, and there's not that with MJF, but you're struggling now. What are we doing? Where is the continuity and consistency? And honestly, that's going to be the biggest part of this show. Continuity and consistency. It's just not there with all elite wrestling. And there's been a lot of scuttlebutt uh, surrounding the promotion and people being un ha unhappy backstage. And I won't get too far into that, but it's because of the kind of tonal shift of the company. Why do we have writers? Now, if Mercedes Monet wants Jennifer Peppermint, sure. One writer for one person. Hey, you are going to get this and they're going to write specifically for that one person. Okay, fine. It makes Mercedes happy. She's a big star. Okay. We can live with that. We can live with the idea that one person wants a writer, but this has always been a company that's supposed to be about the alternative. We are different. We are not WWE. We are not TNA. We are going to be real professional wrestling. All Japan did not have writers. New Japan's glory days did not have writers. Do you think they had writers in Mid-Atlantic? In Jim Crockett promotions? No. There's obviously a booking and creative team. And hey, this is your general direction. This is your general story arc. Make stuff happen. But there's never been a 
concrete set of writers. WWE's had that for a long, long, long time because they don't want to be professional wrestling. They want to be a television show that happens to include wrestling. And that's where the difference lies. AEW is supposed to be wrestling. Wrestling does not have writers. Wrestling has a creative team that gets storylines and directions pushed. The early part of AEW, where it was really gaining momentum up until like CM Punk came in and even through that era, was great. Why? The wrestlers were the ones who were technically the writers. They were given a direction. They made it happen. That's the best way to produce professional wrestling. And it's been consistent whenever you look at all the hot periods of professional wrestling across the last 50, 60 years. Wrestlers are the best when it comes to this stuff. You need a booker to get the directions in proper place to make sure the right people are in certain roles, but you don't need a, a creative writing team that's writing all this stuff. And it feels like now that we have that, we're seeing all these logic gaps. And it started off right away in this last episode of Dynamite, where Alex Marvez is in the hotel parking garage? Why would Alex Marvez be with Will Ospreay in a hotel parking garage? Why? What are we doing? It, this is not professional wrestling. His tires are slashed. Uh, Marvez gives Osprey the keys and he, he drives uh, to... Uh, um, to this arena. But this line is absurd. Well, I have to ask you, have you ever driven in America? And Osprey says, nope. If Osprey has a rental car in the parking lot garage of the hotel, how did it get there? Logic gap number one. How in the hell did it get there? Osprey didn't just teleport with it. His dog didn't drive it. How did he get there? Osprey drove it, obviously. It, it, it's just bonkers. And now you have to really kick off the, the in arena portion of the show, MJF with the National Arena League teams, cheerleaders coming out, and he makes his entrance. And he talks about Will Ospreay, um, not hitting the Tiger Driver 91 because he's got this coward, and then Swerve talking about the world title. And he says, I'm telling you, I'm just waiting for the right moment to pounce. So keep an eye on that, especially when we find out about Wembley and what's going to happen with MJF. Uh, he turns it into the American championship, not the international one. And he gets another gimmick belt. Why are we giving this guy another gimmick belt? Are they really selling that much merch with these belts? I can't imagine they are. It just devalues these titles. You don't need to have a gimmick belt. It's dumb. It's incredibly dumb. And it's very, very frustrating to see that this company is diverging into something that it didn't want to be. It sucks. It really, really sucks. But he gets it, and then Osprey comes out, after, oh, I forgot to mention this. MJF threw the original international title into garbage can like he's Medusa on Nitro. It sucks. It sucks. It sucks. I hate it. I hate this. But I progress. Osprey comes out and uh, goes and attacks MJF, but MJF runs. Then he challenges him for Wembley at All In. Says he talked to Tony Khan and Christopher Daniels. Wasn't that supposed to be Pac shot at the international title? Are we just completely ignoring the fact that Pac won a, I believe it was a gauntlet match or battle royal to get that opportunity? Or was it a four-way? That part doesn't matter but it was supposed to be for all in. So we're just moving that and just completely ignoring it because Pat came out, said number one contender for the international title. And why is Will Ospreay getting the shot? Rematch. Didn't that specifically say rematch clause, but a rematch. What are we doing? 
I don't know what happened with Tony Khan hiring Will Washington as almost like this continuity uh, person to help really keep cohesive focus within the promotion. And this is a really tough one because I don't want to bury Will Washington. Uh, every time I listen to him on RBR and Grapsity, Will is an incredibly intelligent guy who understands this business. AEW announced that they were hiring him to kind of take over some of these features to make sure that they were s- having continuity within the pr- promotion because there was some that was just was just missing. And Tony Khan, look, he does a great job booking. He puts together some tremendous cards, some of the best pay-per-views we've ever seen. But he also has jobs with Fulham Soccer Club in the Premier League and <clears throat> is a high-up executive and uh, minority owner with the Jacksonville Jaguars. So it's not like that he has like a, a f- nine to five accounting job and then goes and bartends two nights a week. He's got real big boy jobs across multiple different levels of sports. He needed some help and that's okay. It's okay to have help. But if Washington was hired to do this job, to keep that continuity, why is the continuity getting worse? I don't think it's Will Washington. I don't want to completely absolve him because at the end of the day, it's his responsibility. It's his title. But when you look at things on a deeper level, if he was brought in for that, why isn't that job getting better? Was he immediately reassigned? Was he asked to do other things that did not involve the his job title? That these are great questions. Because ever since Will Washington came into the promotion, it's gotten worse. Um, so the tweet from Tony Khan. May 3rd, 2023. Will Washington. He is the new AEW Wrestling Administration Coordinator, working in many areas of wrestling, live events, social media, creative, PR. But why isn't he... Like, the idea was that he was supposed to help with some of this stuff. It's... It's just tough. It's tough to see that it's just getting worse. And I don't know how you fix it. You got to have an overhaul. You got to let the the wrestlers take back control of creative. Give John Moxley and Brian Danielson the book and they just have everything flow through Tony Khan. You want great professional wrestling? Have those guys do it. It's amazing how much this promotion needs Cody back. Cody's mind for pro wrestling is tremendous. You, We can have arguments all we want if Cody is a great professional wrestler, if you enjoy his style. But damn, the mind. Some of the stuff they were doing when he was, he was there was fantastic. Now we go backstage. Bryce Remsburg does the coin flip to see who would have the advantage of blood and guts. A lot of logic gaps here. One, why is only the elite there? Two, why is the elite giving Bryce Remsburg the coin? So many different things here. And then the elite just admits that they had a a, a gimmicked coin. Yeah, the heels are supposed to get the advantage of blood and guts. That's fine. Do we need to go through all of this? And why didn't Tony Khan just say, hey, no, it's a gimmick coin. You cheated. You don't get the advantage anymore. Tony Khan runs the show. This is where the EVP angle really loses me completely. And it sucks because the EVP angle could be good, but there's no consistency. EVPs can make matches, and then all of a sudden they can't, and Tony Khan doesn't uh, you know, step in on any kind of permanent basis. And you don't want Tony Khan as an on-screen authority figure either so what do you do maybe just don't do the fucking angles maybe just don't do the storyline is it really that hard do we really have to do this no it sucks 
It absolutely sucks. And this is going to come into play later because there's even more logic gaps with the elite. This match I really did enjoy. Chris Jericho, the learning tree, defeats Minoru Suzuki in the FTW title match uh, with a low blow um, and then gets the Judas effect for the pinfall. But after the match, Suzuki spikes him with a gotcha style pile driver, which was awesome. But this match gave me massive vibes initially of New Japan Cup match between Minoru Suzuki and Eugene Gata in 2020 where it's the beginning of clap crowd wrestling in Japan. And they had to kind of figure out how to work around that because it was just like Japanese pro wrestling and American pro wrestling are just inherently different. So you have Suzuki and Nagata. They just chop each other and hit each other nonstop for like 15 ish minutes. And then Eugene Nagata just sits a backdrop driver and gets a pin. Great match. One of my favorite matches of that year. I think it made my top 10 match of the year list. So this is awesome. And then eventually, uh, towards the end, they it started with a code breaker, and then they uh, got a Walls of Jericho. Suzuki counters out of it. Suzuki gets the sleeper, tries to go for the guy-style pile driver, and then we get the finish. Good match. Four stars. I thought this was awesome. I thought it was a lot of fun. And it was a different type of match. Chris Jericho, you don't have to like him. You can be annoyed by this character. At the end of the day, why in the world? Like, is he like, let me rephrase that. He is one of the absolute best in AEW in drawing television ratings. You may hate him. You may be annoyed by him. You want to see him go away. He's a draw. And I, I'm not going to lie. I'm really getting into this learning tree gimmick. I think Big Bill's a phenomenal heater. Uh, I don't like that Brian Keith is being called the bad apple. I think just the bounty hunter is fine. But that is what it is. They were banned from ringside in this match. And they come out and attack Suzuki. And then, oddly enough, Katsuyori Shibata comes for the save. And wipes out Big Bill and Brian Keith, which is weird considering the history of Shibata and Suzuki, but this is AEW. But that's also why it's weird because pro wrestling canon is AEW canon. Maybe it's just one of those things where Shibata doesn't want to see his enemies get out one up on anybody, and it doesn't really matter that it's Suzuki. They didn't really show anything with Suzuki and Shibata, but it was interesting. Renee Paquette backstage interviewed a new CML Women's World Champion Willow Nightingale who won it at Fantasca Mania United States of America on the 13th of July beating, uh, I think it was Viva Van and one other woman to win the title. And Willow starts to, to talk and then Chris Statlander um, nails her with a cheap shot and then gets like a almost like a flapjack type move onto a bunch of um, storage containers for like audio equipment. Stokely is like, how about next weekend dynamite? We have an eliminator match for the CML women's world title. Um, I was like, well, what do you say? Well, also let us know. Um, this is fine. I don't think you needed to involve that title, um, but it's good that they're, you know, because they're partners with CML. That's fine. Early in the day, Renee Paquette interviewed the American Dragon, Brian Danielson, and boy, was this great. Uh, Jeff Jarrett is still a baby face, uh, talks to Brian Danielson, tr- kind of pump him up. Uh, I've heard your entire conversation. I just have to say this. You know better than anyone that I was crushed that I didn't win the Owen, but in hindsight, if they look back over it, you overcame the odds that I didn't, and you were the perfect guy. Couldn't have been prouder to stand in that ring in Calgary and raise your hand. But now you're going to face the champion who knows exactly what he needs to do. Dialed in and focus on the championship. I understand you have to heal up physically, but I think you've got a lot of mental healing to get done. I like that Jared's trying to pump him up because he knows how much Owen meant to him. And I know Daniel said doing a great job and kind of honoring that legacy with his win. But this is a tremendous promo. And I have two problems with it. One of them is not so much a problem. It's an annoyance. They put all their great interview stuff on YouTube. You know who goes to YouTube? P 
people who are just randomly scrolling through and will click something. But that doesn't necessarily translate to television views. And the diehards, Joe Schmo, who tunes in for Dynamite once a week, is not going to go and watch this. Put this on your television. It's great. It's phenomenal. Some of the best stuff AEW's ever done have been promos that have been sent to YouTube. The Matt Menard promos, the Eddie Kingston promos, Brian Danielson, John Moxley. Stop putting this shit on YouTube. Put it on your main television products. You have six hours. You have six fucking hours of television. You have an eight-minute promo? Find a way to get it on there. Use it to pump up Rampage. It, it's a bunch of shit. I should not have to seek this out because it's good. You should be telling me it's good by putting it on television. Dr. Britt Baker versus Kara Sheet is next. Good show. Good match. Three and a half stars. Solid. Britt Baker gets a win. Kara Sheet kind of got the heat up wins leading up to the match. Keep her strong. After the match, uh, Mercedes Monet walks onto the ramp. And guess what? Camille jumps her. And I loved this. Camille looks like a badass. Acts like a badass. Is physical like a badass. And she picks up Britt and puts her in a torture rack and is literally bending her back. And we know that Britt Baker had back issues. This is great. Five-star torture rack. Tony Schiavone s- sold it very well in commentary. Look at the size of Camille. She's gigantic. Awesome. Awesome stuff. The undisputed trios champions, the patriarchy who just won them on collision, were backstage um, talking about... Uh, how his son Nick is entered in the Royal Rampage. He's going to walk out the number one contender. And then Kip Sabian standing backstage walks up to him. Um, they have an exchange. Oh boy, I can't wait to see them interact in the match. It's going to be a big moment. Fuck him. Fuck it. Who cares about Kip Sabian versus Nick Wayne? Nobody. Bastard Pack defeats Boulder. Quick squash. No big deal. Then the glamour Mariah May versus Caitlin. Not Caitlin. Caitlin. Alexis. W- wins the match with a running hip attack. And then the storm zero. Timeless Tony Storm music plays after the match. And it was all ruse because Mariah May begins to laugh. But Tony Storm appears in the ring. A little bit of a different look. But it's obviously still the. Uh, timeless Tony gimmick. And this line was fantastic. I loved it. Tony with just a psychotic look in her eyes. Are you prepared to die? Because I am. Awesome stuff. Phenomenal. This match has heat and hate. They should. This is a death match women's division. Do a death match at Wembley. Please. Next up, Blood and Guts. AEW defeats the Elite, and getting there was a struggle. It was a big struggle. The pre-show coin flip we talked about. Jack Perry, Darby Allen, they beat each other up. Garbage cans, lawn darts, all kinds of stuff. Nicholas Jackson comes in. They get the advantage, and they beat down Darby. But then Mark Briscoe comes out to a huge reaction, evens the odds. And yeah, Matthew Jackson come out. They triple team Darby Allen. Uh, and Anthony Bowens comes out. I got to say, Bowens is really good in this match. He worked very hard. You could tell how much he wanted to be great in this match. Um, Bowens pulls out a pair of scissors and he hit Perry with them. Uh, and he like had the scissors in Perry's mouth for a minute, which was a sick spot. Uh, 
it didn't look like it actually did any real life damage to Perry, but it looked just disgusting. It was awesome. Um, and then he used Perry's head as a pin cushion, which was great. Uh, Okada comes out next. Uh, he brings out a street sign that says Rainmaker on it, which was awesome. And you he uses it a little bit and spikes Briscoe with a tombstone. Caster comes to the ring with a microphone. You think he's going to do a rap. No, he's just means business and he just uses it almost like a like I think some people hated this and I didn't really mind it as much because okay, he's gonna come out with a microphone, he's gonna do a rap like he always does. No, he just beats people up with it and then throws it aside. I thought that was a really nice spot. Uh then we have four on four. And there were some interesting spots uh during this four on four segment. They put tax in a Max Caster's mouth and then they pu- the Young Bucks pumped up their Reebok pumps and super kicked him. Uh, they also sandwiched Anthony Bowens with Barb Ryer and Nicholas Jackson hit a senton off the top rope. Pretty, pretty dope. Um, look, Anthony Bowens took some gnarly bumps in this match and he kind of had the abyss look. Like, if you remember Abyss... I think it was barbed wire massacre against Sabu when he gets on the barbed wire and he's just like shaking and trembling because he just landed on it. It was that kind of look. Awesome. Awesome spot. Hangman's music bit plays. He doesn't come out. Why doesn't he come out? Well, I thought this might happen. Because there's no swerve. He doesn't want to be out there. He wants swerve. That's all he wants. Made it clear. It's all he wants. Swerve comes out. And as Swerve's coming out, Paige ambushes him with a steel chair. Paige handcuffs Swerve to the side of the ring. And throws some punches. And then smashes the title of Swerve's head. This is where we started to get up, off the rails. Matthew Jackson grabs the microphone. I believe the same one that Max Caster brought in the ring. Hangman, what are you doing? We have a deal. Last time we suspended you sat at home. If you don't get your ass in the ring, you're fired. Fuck that. We don't need mid-match promos. This isn't Roman Reigns. This is this is bullshit. How how can they fire him without Tony Khan's approval? What too many logic gaps. And then Hangman gets in the ring. And you're supposed to have all 10 combatants in the ring before the match starts. Guess what? Only nine were in the ring. And the bell rings. The fuck are we doing? What are we doing? It's all a bunch of shit. Then Jeff Jarrett comes out of the ring with the guitar because he's kind of been... Quasi involved with this whole process. Brandon Cutler runs out and confronts Jarrett. Daddy ass walked down, pop Cutler in the mouth, and then Jarrett smashed the guitar. They hand the key for the head handcuffs to swerve. And Strickland uses like a wire cutter to cut through the cage, gets in the ring, went after the elite. And then you get the hangman and swerve stare down. I think it would have been better to not have them touch at all. But I also think that they did this okay. They beat each other up. Um, Paige had swerves with a barbed wire board. Swerve has a staple gun, tries to use it on Hangman, but Nicholas Jackson hits him with a low blow. And guess what? They all bring out staple guns. Yep. The Young Bucks bring out staple guns for everybody. They all staple him. And Swerve laughs it off. But then Swerve gets a staple to everybody's face, except Okada, who just gets one to the finger. And then Okada is pretty much done for the match. Look, Okada's cashing a check here, buddy. He's barely had to work. And when he's worked, he hasn't had to do much. Good on him, but God, it sucks. Absolutely sucks. Young Bucks bring out four tables. 
Bowens and Nicholas climb up and Bowens loses grip and boom. Falls to the table. Hangman and Swerve go up the stage at this point. And then they both uh, collapse through tables just off to the right. They're out of the match. All right. In the ring, Mark Na- Mark Briscoe just nails everybody with the J-Driller. And this had the spot of the match. Darby Allen scales the top of the cage and climbs out to the middle and hits Jack Perry with a coffin drop through a table while he's climbing like Spider-Man. Cool as absolute hell. Then they handcuff every member of the elite to the ropes and handcuff Jack Perry like like uh almost like how Jesus was on the cross with his arms extended out and they start beating him with a kendo stick. They ask him if he's going to quit and he said he spits at Jack Briscoe. So they hit him with a chair. Darby's like, "You quit? Nope. All right, let's get this party started." And he grabs a gas can, pours it over Jerry's head, and he says, "I'm gonna last your let your ass on fire if you don't quit. I want to match for the TNT title at all in. Agree to, or I'm gonna light your ass on fire." Jack Perry was so good here, spits at Darby, and he's got this little bit where he's genuinely trembling it's it's minor it's not over the top but it's enough to be like hey i'm gonna be defiant and i'm gonna take this like a man but he's obviously freaked out that he might be burned burned alive and matthew jackson this has gone too far you want the match for tnc title on you've got it again EVP is making matches in the middle of a fucking match. What are we doing, Tony Khan? Where is your company gone? This is what your competition does. You're better than that. You proved you're better than that. Be better. Darby says, no, hell no. Say I quit or I light his ass on fire. Matthew. All right, damn it. We quit. AW wins blood and guts. In this match, there were plenty of parts that were a good match. Too many logic gaps. Too much bullshit. Mid-match promos and shit. Fuck that. Team AEW seemed to be more in it for themselves except Mark Briscoe. Mark Briscoe's in it for the team. The acclaimed wanted their tag title match. Darby wanted a TNT title match, which honestly could be really good with where Jack Perry's at right now. And Swerve want a hangman. Obviously, it makes sense to pair them together. Team AEW is never on the same page, and they showed that before the match. Three and a half. This could have been really good, and it just wasn't because the logic gaps. AEW is a massive logic gap right now, and they need to figure their shit out. Because when their shit's on, it's real good. The Hangman Swerve story is being told very, very well. Brian Danielson versus Swerve at All In is going to be tremendous. This could have been great. Honestly, they shouldn't have done this for Blood and Guts because it felt forced. It did not feel real. did not feel genuine. They could have built it up for a much longer period of time. But... Unfortunately, Bun Guts like Elimination Chamber and, and tables, ladders, and chairs and money in the bank where you just got to have it once a year. You don't. You have it when it's necessary. And this is why this company is straying off course because this company was supposed to be an alternative. It was supposed to be professional wrestling. Professional wrestling. Returning in sports entertainment. And I'm going to be real with you. Fucking sucks. It sucks. Get rid of your logic gaps. Take away the sports entertainment bullshit. This EVP thing with the Bucks needs to end and now. Tony, you're the boss of the company. You've already overruled the Bucks on multiple occasions. 
Just strip them of their EVP powers. Say they can't make matches or something. Just get rid of it. That's Blood and Guts. A show that could have been way better than it was, but AEW continues to get in their own head. Fred will be back next week. I will have a big announcement. And we are going to be coming at you leading up to All In, the biggest show of the year for All Elite Wrestling. Over 40,000 tickets already sold to Wembley. This looks to be a really good card so far. And we're going to talk a lot about it over the next few weeks. In the meantime, please give us a five-star review. Uh, Donations are if you want to give to us because we are awesome and you love the fact that I'm screaming at the company. Please, uh, the link is in our show notes. Go ahead and uh, give us a donation. Meantime, Tyler Fornes, thank you very much for listening. Have a wonderful night and enjoy the Olympics. They start, they've already started technically. Hey kids, do you like wrestling? Well, we like wrestling too. We are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Myself and Chris Novembrino kind of doing a lazy river of wrestling criticism, going through the news and whatever happened in stateside television wrestling. And also, you know what? Sometimes we just like to watch old stuff and talk about that too. Love for you to give us a listen. If you haven't already, we are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network.